name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Today, it is true that many people believe that they are missing Easter. And that is because they don't gather at a particular location. But it is the fact that Easter comes each Lord's Day. That's what the first day of the week is all about. And whether we're gathered here or in spirit together online in some fashion, this is Easter that happens nonetheless. You cannot be skipping Easter when you come to the Lord Jesus Christ on the first day of the week to worship him and to receive of his grace that he promises to whosoever will come. And so as we gather again on this Lord's Day, Happy Easter, for the 15th time this year, we enter in because he is on the throne. He is alive, he will one day return, and therefore we give him praise as we will do throughout eternity. This is a glorious undertaking that we take up today. We may be small in number, we may be alone as you worship today, but think of throughout all the world how Christ is being sought and found on this holy day. Let's enter in and let's praise the name of our Savior. Today we're singing one song, and it's Psalm 118. So if you have a psalm book there, and you'll be joining us that way, we're going to sing B, C, D, and E. We start off with Psalm 118b. Because he's good, oh, thank the Lord. His love endures forever. Let Israel say with one accord, his love endures forever. You may be able to think at particular times when you knew the love of God applied to you. The day maybe when you first came to Jesus Christ to be forgiven. Maybe there was a particular trial that you found yourself in, and you prayed, and God made his love to be known by you. We're reminded in the psalm that his love endures forever. Oh, that we would have an understanding of the constant love of our God. His love endures forever. And therefore, let us stand, let us worship the name of Jesus Christ, because he is Good. Let's stand to sing his name. 118b. La, la, because he's good, oh, thank the Lord, his mind endures forever. Let Israel say, His love endures forever. Let Aaron's house this tribute pay. His love endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord bless him. His love endures forever. When to the Lord distressed I cry, the Lord reply and free me, because the Lord is on my side. In fear I have been set free. Why should I fear what man can do? The Lord stands by to help me. I'll look in triumph. Who hated and opposed me? In men place not your confidence to trust the Lord is better. 
remain standing and call on the name of our God in prayer. <clears throat> o Lord our God, our Father in heaven, you are our shelter in the Lord Jesus Christ. We've heard much of sheltering in place. We've heard much of being in our shelter. And Lord, as we come and worship you in spirit and truth on this first day of the week, we proclaim that Christ alone is the shelter for our soul. We find in him a place of refuge. He is our strong fort, our tower of safety. And in him we are protected from the judgment of God against us for our sins. There is no other place of safety but Christ alone. And we rejoice in your goodness and your constant love that keeps us safe because Christ, as our Passover lamb, has shed his blood, and it has been applied to the doorposts of our lives, that we would be kept safe in him. And Lord, as we draw near, we come also then with joy. We come with rejoicing. You've spared us from death. You've helped us in times of sin and misery by providing your Son as our great keeping Savior. All worship that we bring is to him. All of our songs, all of our joy, our thanksgiving, our affections are to you in his name. And we pray that he would look on all of his people worshiping today in spirit and truth, here and there, everywhere, that his favor would be on his people. Lord Jesus, you are enthroned on the praises of your people. Give us renewed joy, a sense of renewed hope of the everlasting life that is ours now and one day will be in full forever. Lord, blessed be your holy name. Give us joy this day. Look on all of us. Look on your ordinances of worship and cause them to be of much help and power to us today. Remember the needy, remember the lonely, remember the oppressed, and Lord, draw people to yourself on this day that commemorates life by your death and resurrection. Hear us as we pray and bless our worship for the glory of Christ. We are an unworthy people, and yet made worthy by the blood of Christ and faith in him, we come because you've bid us. There's nothing to fear. There's everything to celebrate. And so we do. <clears throat> Hear us now and look on us with your favor. We ask with the confession of our sins and trusting in the mercies of Christ. We pray in his name and for his sake. Amen. And we'll be seated again, singing over at Psalm 118 C. where David had to take on the surrounding nations and those who oppressed him. It's a picture of what our Lord endured and something of what the resurrection hope is all about. All earth's nations joined together. They encircled me around, but I cut off in the Lord's name all those who did me surround. Christ overcame death. He is the captain of our salvation. Christ is alive, there is no foe, not even death itself, not Satan, the devil, not anyone to come against the kingdom of Christ. Christ rules supreme. Let us celebrate in the victory of what our Savior has known himself and given to us by free grace alone. Psalm 118c, let's stand once again. <clears throat> La 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 All earth's nations join together They encircle me around But I 
cut off in the Lord's name. All those who did me surround, they surrounded and enclosed me. Yes, from every side they came, but I cut them. two passages in scripture. The first is merely one verse in the Proverbs. Proverb 26, verse 27. And then in the New Testament, chapter 27 of Matthew's Gospel, reading from verse 57 through verse 15 of chapter 28. So Proverbs 26, and then Matthew 27. Let's pray first and ask for the Lord to bless his word as it's read and preached and heard by each one of us. Father, as we come to your word, we come with the conviction of Peter that when presented with the occasion to withdraw and go in the way of many other once disciples, stumbling over the very words of our Savior, that his reply was, to whom else shall we go? You alone have words of eternal life. Lord, we come because we're needy. We come because you are our teacher. We come because what you say is life to us. We do not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of your mouth. Lord, give us then ears to hear and hearts to take in all that you would have us to consider this day. And Lord, enliven us, give us renewed hope, and cause our faith to be ever more sure, and our hope bright, as we look not only in events of the past, but all that you have prepared for those who love you. Lord, advance your kingdom, and bring glory to your name in both the reading and in the preaching of your word. This we ask, Father, in Jesus' name, and for his sake, amen. <clears throat> Proverbs chapter 26, just one simple verse, it's there at verse 27. He who digs a pit will fall into it, and he who rolls a stone, it will come back on him. We'll consider this again, but over in Matthew chapter 27 is where we find the events of the burial and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Of course, earlier in chapter 27, he has had his trial, an unjust trial. He has faced the mistreatment and the cruelty of men. He's been sentenced to die. 
He was crucified and gave his life as a ransom for many. And we pick it up here in Matthew 27, verse 57. When it was evening, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who himself had also become a disciple of Jesus. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. When Pilate ordered it to be given to him, Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in his new own tomb, which he had hewn out in the rock. He had rolled a large stone against the entrance of the tomb and went away. And Mary Magdalene was there and the other Mary sitting opposite the grave. Now on the next day, the day after the preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered together with Pilate and said, Sir, we remember that when he was still alive, that deceiver said, After three days I am to rise again. Therefore give orders for the grave to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise his disciples may come and steal him away and say to the people, he has risen from the dead. And the last deception will be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, you have a guard, go, make it as secure as you know how. And they went and made the grave secure. And along with the guard, they set a seal on the stone. Now after the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to look at the grave. And behold, a severe earthquake had occurred, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled away the stone and sat upon it. And his appearance was like lightning and his clothing as white as snow. The guards shook for fear of him, and he became, and they became like dead men. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus, who has been crucified. He is not here, for he has risen, just as he said. Come, see the place where he was lying. Go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. And they left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy and ran to report it to his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and greeted them. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshiped him. And then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and take word to my brethren to leave for Galilee, and there they will see me. Now while they were on their way, some of the guard came into the city and reported to the chief priests all that had happened. And when they had assembled with the elders and consulted together, they gave a large sum of money to the soldiers and said, You are to say, His disciples came by night, and stole him away while we were asleep. And if this should come to the governor's ears, we will win him over and keep you out of trouble. And they took the money and did as they had been instructed. And this story was widely spread among the Jews as it is to this day. We'll end our reading of God's word here. May he bless it to us. Life has its interesting ironies. The man who repair, repairs roofs may himself have a leaky roof. A writer can spend weeks by himself on a small island to write a book about the dangers of loneliness. A person who never smoked may contract lung cancer. And even the oncologist himself 
may die of cancer. Life has its interesting ironies. The proverb that we read reminds us of this very thing when it says, he who digs a pit will fall into it, and he who rolls a stone, it will come back on him. Clearly, it speaks against those who scheme evil. It speaks against those who lay plots, against those who make traps. What he schemes against others will be done to himself. As the proverb says, it will come back on him. Haman the Agagite schemed, you remember, to take the life of Mordecai, the God-fearing Jew. And yet Esther tells us how that all turned out. So they hanged Haman on the gallows he had prepared for Mordecai. This is irony. When you think one thing is to happen, but then another thing, a different thing, surprisingly happens in spite of all the odds and plans against it, this other thing, unexpected, defying all the odds, is irony. It's ironic. The Bible is full of irony. What do we hear it saying but that the first will be last, and the last will be first? It says that many will come from east and west, and recline at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, but the sons of the kingdom will be cast out into the outer darkness. They said to Jesus, you are not yet 50 years old, and you have seen Abraham? And Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was born, I am. That is irony. The Bible is full of irony. And this very wise statement of the Proverbs helps us to see what I'm calling today Easter's irony. He who rolls a stone, it will come back on him. Now it is true, Joseph of Arimathea is the one who, after Jesus' death, as Matthew tells us, rolled a large stone against the entrance of the tomb and went away. It was his tomb. But in a real sense, with the subject at hand, the religious leaders are the ones who really rolled the stone. They wanted Jesus dead. Jesus died. They had that. They wanted him to stay dead, but they couldn't have that. Why is it? It's because he who rolls a stone, it will come back on him. Joseph had rolled the stone, and yet the Jews had rolled the stone. And even so, with yet another twist of irony, it was God who rolled back the stone. What is going on here but the secret and the sovereign working of God's own power? Things are not specifically stated. There is sort of a passivity in the way that the stone rolls back again. It says, it will come back on him. Well, who will do that? It's not stated. It happened the same way on the resurrection morning of the Lord's day. The Gospels are unanimous. They are united in saying that the stone was already rolled away. Who did this? God did it. His angel did it. Behold, a severe earthquake had occurred, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled away the stone and sat upon it. <clears throat> and so then, as we look at this irony of Easter, we really can see it better when we look in relation to these two points that I think are set forth in light of this. The first is what I'll call resurrection drama. The second one is what I'm calling resurrection doctrines. 
Now there's the drama, and there are the doctrines of the resurrection. There were ironies before the resurrection. If you remember, Judas Iscariot had earned his 30 pieces of silver for betraying Jesus to the high priests. And yet when he was paid, he no sooner threw it out, having realized just what he did. That's a dramatic irony. We look at Pontius Pilate, believing that he had authority over Jesus, was told by Jesus under trial that he would have no authority unless it had been given him from heaven. Pilate offered Barsabbas, you remember, to the Jews, figuring it would get an obviously innocent Jesus off free. But it came back on him, almost like a boomerang, when the crowd chanted for Jesus to be crucified and Barsabbas to be set free. And so what did Pilate do? And yet another twist of irony, he washed his hands, innocent of any guilt, and yet sinfully allowed innocent Jesus to be crucified. Another dramatic irony. Then there are his soldiers. They mockingly dressed the Lord in priestly colors of royal purple. They set a crown of thorns on his head and hailed him as king of the Jews. And yet little did they know that he was in fact the priest king according to the order of Melchizedek, king not only of the Jews, but of all the earth. This is another irony. There is Joseph of Arimathea. He had already planned as a rich man to be buried in his own personal tomb. But grace had changed all of that. He thinks differently now. Now, he asks for the, for the body of Jesus from Pilate, and Joseph took the body, wrapped it in a clean linen cloth, and laid it in his own new tomb. This is irony. This is the drama that's going on here even before the day of resurrection. It even continued there with Jesus in the grave which is why we see the chief priests and the Pharisees then gathered before Pilate, concerned that since Jesus had said that he would rise again three days later, that Pilate ought then to command that the grave be secured under guard. They were concerned that the disciples would steal the body. And they would claim that Jesus was risen. And so they not only placed the guard, but they secured and sealed the tomb. Then there are the guards alongside them. After Jesus was raised, they then enter into the city to report the empty tomb. We can almost imagine their back and forth with the chief priests. The priests saying, what's the matter? Where, why are you here? You guards should be out guarding the tomb. And the guards say, well, we were, but then an angel came, and we were terrified because of him and the earthquake, and we passed out. And when we awoke, the tomb was empty. And then the priests say, what? You what? The tomb was what? Quiet. The people will hear us. Wait here while we call the elders. And then once the elders come in, here's how this needs to be handled, men. Here's the storyline. You men know that you ought to be put to death for this dereliction of duty. You were supposed to guard the tomb, but you fell asleep. You will say that the disciples, if you want your own lives, you will say that the disciples stole the body. And if Pilate hears, we'll protect you. Now here's some money. Guards give thanks. They go away thankful for their lives and certainly thankful for the money. Don't you think it's ironic that right here with all these events, just before the crucifixion and just after the resurrection, money is corrupting people from understanding the truths of the gospel. 
Men were buying favors. God is redeeming sinners. I find that highly ironic, even to the current day. But these ironic scenarios merely build as if grace under pressure to Easter's explosive irony. He who rolls a stone, it will come back on him. Jesus rose from the dead. Easter's irony, the stone that the builders rejected, has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. It is ironic in our sight. Quite ironically, they rolled away the stone, capital S. And in rolling away the stone, small s, Jesus returned alive to build his church exactly as he meant to do, exactly as he said that he would. This is why the apostles preached this text from Psalm 118, that the stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. They preached it in Acts 4.11. Paul quotes it in Romans 9.33. Peter quotes it at 1 Peter 2.7. And for this reason, you and I should heed it. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. And this stone has rolled away the stone. Easter's irony. So much for the disciples being able to steal his body and claim that he had risen. Jesus rose himself and claimed it in their very presence. This is irony. So much for the guards' strength. So much for the priestly plots. So much for a rolled stone. So much for the secured seal, as if they could somehow straightjacket the Prince of Life and keep the resurrection and the life inside the tomb. That is Easter's irony. All attempts to keep Christ in the grave had failed. The first day of the week then, the resurrection day of our Lord Jesus Christ, was a day of God's wisdom outwitting the foolish wisdom of men. It was a day of grace overcoming sin. It was a day of hope to despairing sinners. This was the initial break of the fountain to the sinful and impure to water the dry and thirsty nations of the world. Jesus' resurrection, we could say, is a New Testament Gilgal where Jesus rolled away the stone and thereby rolled away our reproach as if a new Joshua bringing us into the promised land. It was Easter's irony. And if you have ears to hear it, Jesus' resurrection here is but the echo of Joseph's ironic words to his brothers. You meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result to preserve many people alive. That's an echo of Joseph's words. The thing that's ironic is that when you have an echo, what happens to the second round? You say it once, but the second one is softer. It's more distant. But with this echo, it's gotten louder. It's gotten much louder. We could even say that it is a truly, truly, you meant this for evil, but God meant it for good, to the preserving of many souls alive this day. In summary, the altogether wise God has thoughts and ways that are higher than your and my thoughts and ways. 
With the crooked, the psalm says, God shows himself astute. God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise, the weak things to shame the strong, the base things to nullify things that are, so that no one may boast before God. It's as Mary declared at the beginning of all this redemptive drama, he sent away the rich empty-handed. He who rolls a stone, it will turn back on him again. And that's Easter's irony. That's the great wonder of this resurrection drama. We see it secondly, as I said, in resurrection doctrines. Doctrines that have to do with the resurrection. The first one is this, that the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead is an historical Proven fact, despite attempts to obscure it. We could say that to try to obscure the fact or overcome the truth of Jesus' resurrection is to have the stone roll back on you. Many people have tried to roll the stone back onto the grave once again. The problem is they're unsuccessful. The stone, could we say, is too heavy. They are too weak. The evidence itself demonstrates its truth. People are here given evidence that every skeptic or every scientist would otherwise want. They're also given what every judge and what every jury would always want, and that is valid testimony. We could mention such things as Old Testament prophecies. These Old Testament prophecies accurately pinpoint the fulfillment of all these things of Jesus of Nazareth, everything from his incarnation to his life and his death, even to his resurrection. Things that he had no control over, and yet they speak of them and they happen as recorded history. We could mention such things as the women who came from the tomb, having seen it closed, and came and saw it open. We could mention the disciples who went to the tomb, saw it empty, after poo-pooing these women, who said that they saw it open. And these disciples themselves found it exactly as the women had said. And so they said to Thomas that next Lord's Day, we have seen the Lord. As Peter would later refer to themselves, eyewitnesses of his majesty. We could mention angels sitting outside the empty tomb saying that it was empty, where Jesus had gone and where he would meet his disciples. We could mention corpses that once were in their tombs and now alive had come into the city after Jesus' resurrection. We can mention Jesus standing himself in the midst of disciples behind shut doors commanding doubting Thomas to reach forth his finger and touch his hands and put it into his side and unbelieving Thomas who refused to believe could not but come to believe the evidence. And so he said, believing on Christ, my Lord and my God. So why don't people believe the resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth? Well, the problem isn't testimony. The problem is not a lack of evidence. The problem is the person himself. It's that he or she won't believe the evidence. They won't believe the testimony. It's not a lack of evidence. It's a lack of faith. And so I ask then, do you believe these things? Is it compelling? And is it not merely that you come to evidence, but that because of the evidence, you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ as he bids. 
The evidence itself demonstrates the truth. Secondly, though, there is the lingering questions that demonstrate the truth. That this teaching of the resurrection of Jesus Christ is historical fact. Lingering questions demonstrate it. Has Jesus not been raised? Then why the concealment, priests? Just show us the body. Here, let's go and discuss this with Pilate. Oh, you don't want to go to Pilate again. Well, you seemed interested to go to him before. Strange. You did earlier. You petitioned him to crucify Jesus. You sought him for a guard at the tomb. Why will you not go now? Has Jesus not been raised? And why is the stone rolled away? And who rolled it away? When our women went to it at dawn, it was already removed. Didn't you have a guard there? Hadn't they sealed the tomb? How about if we ask them? We heard they might have fallen asleep on the job. Usually we know that such guards are killed. Why are they alive? They seem to be living far above their pay grade nowadays. You say Jesus' disciples stole the body from the tomb? How did they take out a whole armed guard of soldiers? Why would the disciples then follow an obvious imposter if Jesus hadn't risen? If they had stolen the body, they would only be kidding themselves. Why would they then be preaching as they are? Why would they endure persecution? How could they live with their conscience knowing that it was all untrue? Why would they go about in relative poverty, sacrificing themselves for other people, gaining nothing for themselves? Why would they waste their time? How do we explain the miracles that they did in Jesus' name? What about the radical conversion of a Christ hater such as Saul of Tarsus? If Jesus didn't rise from the dead, then all these questions show the truth of what Paul's words say. We are then of most men to be pitied. Preaching is vain then. Faith is vain. We're liars. God's a liar. We're still in our sins. Dead believers have perished. All's despair. Coronavirus wins. But now Christ has been raised from the dead. And that changes everything. You ask these kinds of questions, and more questions come about. You preach that Jesus is alive from the dead, and all issues start to be answered. The stone rolled away from the tomb, rolled back on anyone who tries to put it back again. You know what happens when a very large stone is tried to be moved. It hurts when it rolls back up. There's pain. There's ruin. He who rolls a stone, it will come back on him. This is what the evidence itself and the lingering question show. What the scripture says of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, all true. All true. Doctrine number two, salvation then is all of God, none of men. The first century burial custom of rolling a stone over a tomb meant that several would be needed to roll it back. There was sort of a downward gutter that rolling it would then keep it in place. Mark tells us that Jesus' stone was extremely large. 
This would require many people. It implies some degree of permanency. It's interesting then that on the way to the tomb that Sabbath morning, that the women asked, who will roll away the stone? Apparently, they had never thought of that. In the midst of Sabbath day preparations, all the stress of our Lord's death, we can't blame them. But their decision and their dilemma illustrates Easter's irony. One is helpless to overcome death. One is helpless to bring about new life, to make Jesus a risen Savior. Salvation does not go in the direction of man to God. It goes from God to man. It comes outward from within the tomb to those who are before it. The women's question about the stone, as well as the real situation about the rolled stone, illustrates the utter sovereignty and the power of God. Just as the soldier's spear didn't kill Jesus, just as the club for the breaking of his legs was not needed to hurry the death of Jesus, so it was also not needed for any man to roll away the stone and bring Jesus forth or even embalm him. God did it all by himself. You and I cannot contribute anything to our salvation. We bring nothing. And even in the case of the women, what they brought, unneeded. Didn't need it at all. Only Christ accomplished salvation. Only Christ provides it to us. For this reason, the women showed up to an empty tomb, but also to a rolled away stone, never to be put back again. This is Easter's irony. God accepted the one sacrifice of Jesus Christ for sin. God had now brought forth life for believing sinners. Salvation is all of God. It is none of man. It is by grace alone. It is by faith alone. It is in Christ alone. It is according to the scripture alone. And it is for the glory of God alone. It is not by our works, but Christ's. It is not by human achievement, but Christ. Easter's irony is that salvation is all of Christ and none of ours. Again, he who digs a pit is going to fall into it. And he who rolls a stone, it's going to come back on him. It makes me wonder, in light of this doctrine, does this bother you? Does this in some way bother you, irritate you, or does it in fact comfort you? That your salvation is only in God. In God alone is my salvation, the psalm says. Would you try to roll it back over the tomb and then roll it away again to show that by your own efforts and by your own works, the resurrection is shown to be true? A strange irony to Christians, or to Easter, is that Christians, in some way, want to think more highly of themselves than they ought to think. The next time you start trusting yourself, the next time that you start considering yourself wise or strong, or are concerned to try to make Jesus look better, or be more presentable to people, just remember that when you come to the tomb, the stone is already rolled away. Jesus is alive. Jesus is elsewhere than when you're thinking he is. He's gone ahead of you. This too is an irony of Easter. And it's sad that there are Christians that think that they must bring something to have Jesus look better. Or in some way bring an offering rather than marvel at the empty tomb and the risen Savior 
alone. A third doctrine, and we'll close with this one, was that Jesus risen from the dead means that you too, believing on him, are also raised from the dead. How's that for irony? He died and rose, but by faith in Christ alone, you died and rose as well. What an irony. Put yourself among those disciples that resurrection morning on the Lord's day. What are you saying to yourself over and over and over again of all those events of the crucifixion to the resurrection? What are you saying to yourself again and again? You're saying, I can't believe it. I just can't believe it. I can't believe this. There's doubt. There's unbelief. And yet on resurrection morning, as you're still saying that in the face of good news and an absent savior from the tomb, I can't believe it. You're happy and joyful, but you can't believe it. Christians, You've believed on Jesus Christ. You've been identified with him by faith. He has died and alive. Now you are dead to sin and alive to God in Christ. Or are you saying, I just can't believe it? This is the real struggle of Romans chapter 6. In Romans chapter 6, Paul is beginning to deal with such things as sin in the life of a believer. What it means then that justified by the free grace of God in Jesus Christ, only through faith, that what that entails for your standing with God, that you are utterly free, utterly accepted, utterly righteous on the grounds of Christ's righteousness alone. And if any would say, well, that since Christ did it all, and I can just therefore continue in sin. I can turn indifferent to the ironies of the resurrection. But Paul says, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? May it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus, have been baptized into his death, and therefore we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, Certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin because he who has died is freed from sin. But now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again. Death no longer is master over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. And here, for the first command in the letter to the Romans, even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. And therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, so that you obey its lusts. You see how the resurrection changes everything? You say, I can't believe that I've actually died to sin. Oh, you have. You have. You say, I can't believe that I'm alive from the dead with resurrection energy and ability and standing with God? Oh, you are. You have that. You can do all things 
through Christ who strengthens you. You say, I can even look at a temptation and in the midst of the fires of temptation with my most entangling and besetting sins, are you saying that I can say no? That's exactly what I'm saying. That's the irony of Easter. You've died with Christ, and your life is hidden with God. You've been raised up with Christ, seated in the heavenly places. You are alive from the dead. I can't believe it. I just can't believe it. That's where this news meets us on the first day of the week. We come in every week and we say this again and again. I believe, but Lord, help my unbelief. This past week, I've committed sins. What's my hope? It's that Jesus is alive from the dead. And even though you may struggle with sin, wrestle with it, as Paul's assuming here in Romans 6, you're alive from the dead. You can walk in newness of life. You can choose righteousness over sin. Do you not want the glory of Christ? Isn't the resurrection of Jesus Christ something that thrills your soul, makes you alive with joy, and renews hope in a hopeless, despairing world? I can believe. I do believe. That's the irony of Easter. You and I must believe it. Don't roll a stone, lest it come back on you again. Don't not believe the gospel as a believer. How's that? Don't not believe the gospel as a believer. Don't say you're a believer. I believe in the resurrection of the body, as the creed says. Don't say that as a believer, but then not believe it in the hour of temptation. Don't say it, and then at the hour of the death, of your death, say that there's no hope. Is it really true? What will happen to me after I die? Don't not believe the gospel as a believer. Believe it. I believe this. I can believe it. Because Christ is alive from the dead. Christian friend, Easter's irony is not just that Jesus is alive from the dead. It's that you are. You are alive from the dead. And so then go today in the living hope of the resurrection drama and the resurrection doctrines. Go with the risen Savior. As Jesus said, peace be with you. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, who are unworthy to hear such good news, because we often come short of a ripe faith, and yet you met with disciples, and before you did a wonderful thing for them, You'd often preface your words with, do not be afraid. Lord, we may fear for our unbelief, but we take great confidence that you know us better than ourselves. And on the ground of your own death and resurrection, you receive us as we come to you. Lord, we do believe. Help our unbelief. And Lord, we pray that as many are lost in unbelief, Lord, that you would give them faith, faith that will therein live again. Lord, what hope we have for the world in declaring that Christ is alive and Christ is crowned as king, Christ returning again. Lord, help us to bring the word about in these times. May it be that this day, as many are considering it a sort of eastern grave, Lord, may it be a day of newfound hope, of surprising joy, of life in a Savior. Lord, bless us, bless the nations of the world, 
May life come forth out of death even today because Christ is alive from the dead. Apply all these things to our hearts, our minds, our lives, and may it be that Christ, who has overcome and sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, may he show his triumph in our lives, and we do all that we've just sung in these songs, that he is our trust and he is our light. Lord, hear us as we pray. We give our thanks to you. In Christ's name, amen. We'll turn again to sing, and this time Psalm 118 D. Psalm 118 D. Let's stand once again and praise the Lord's name. <clears throat> La la, loud shouts of joy and victory fill the just and gathered side. The right hand of the Lord performs great deeds of valiant might. The Lord's right hand is above the highest high. The right hand of the Lord performs great deeds of valiant life. I will not pass away in that no I will surely and to the works the Lord has done, my testimony give. The Lord so really chasten me, and stand correction give. But he withheld a stroke of death, and spared me from the grave. We'll take our offering this morning and then come to the Lord with a time of prayer. Let us pray together. O oh Lord our God, we come to the throne of grace, and there we not only receive mercy, but receive also that grace to help us in our time of need. Lord, all of these things are yes and amen, because Christ is there for us. He is our great high priest. He is our king. He leads us and guides us, he keeps us, he causes us to follow in his royal train. And Lord, we are honored to have a place with him. We're honored to receive all the blessings of your grace, none of which we deserve, all of which have come at the costly blood of Christ our Savior. How much more then should we rejoice this day to be with exuberant joy, <coughs> that Christ has overcome and sat down and is coming for us. Lord, fill us with hope. We may be looking at particular trials for our own lives. Our work, troubling enough as it is, is now more difficult for us, for some. Pay is decreased. Situations are not ideal. There are its own problems that have entered in. There's the whole economic matter of our savings at points depleted, needs that we have that we can't keep up with. Many are unemployed, our economy suffering. 
Lord, clearly you're chastening the nations of the world. Clearly you're showing the wages of sin, which is not only chastening and judgments, but even death itself. Lord, we pray for mercy in this day, and that as the prophet Habakkuk mentioned that in wrath you would remember mercy. Lord, remember that for countless thousands today. We ask, Lord, that you would call on people, that they would believe on you. We pray that you'd help all sorts of workers today that are keeping public safety, ministering to people in their time of need. Lord, give them special and even added grace than what you've given already. Provide supplies. Grant for people to be wise, cautious, but Lord, not fearful, because you are alive. We ask, Lord, that you would supply for us. Keep us in health. Give us what we need. Give us an ability even to share with those who have need. We thank you that in times of crisis that you especially move in your people that they would serve, that they would pray, fast, and seek your face. Lord, we place our trust not in officials. We don't look so much at forecasts of the condition and place of waves. We don't trust in our own resources, but Lord, we here together trust in you. We seek your face, we seek answer with you, and we pray that your mercy and your grace would supersede that in the common way that people know. Lord, give conversions this day. Make for people to bow the knee to Jesus Christ and recognize that it is in fact a grace that Easter is here, that there is a reason on not merely the 15th day of Easter, but the first day of the week every week of hope of a Savior to be believed. Lord, may this be a day where the church rises up and the truth is declared and people put their hope in the living God. Lord, keep us as your people in all of our needs. Remember them in their needs. Lord, we particularly remember those who on this day ought to be especially encouraged in the resurrection. Lord, even some of our own number, having grieved, having suffered the difficulty of remembering people that have gone. Lord, departing into glory is what believers' hope is. We pray this day that you would comfort them. Lord, we remember Peter. We remember Stephanie. We remember Jesse. We remember others in our family and friends that have gone to be with the Lord, and we pray for special comfort this day in the glorious truth and saving help of the resurrection. Lord, we ask that in our own lives you would give us strength to walk with Jesus, to walk in newness of life. Lord, if we not yet learned in this time of prayer and fasting to forgo our sins, to repent of them all. Lord, lead us in that daily calling of repenting of particular sins, particularly. Lord, we have nowhere else to turn but to you. And how glad we are that it is that clear and that simple that Christ alone is our saving help. We ask that you'd bless our week and may this be a turning of the time, not merely because of human measures taken, but a conviction in people that God has been gracious to us. Lord, may there be a turning of the time and all of what we celebrate today in the resurrection of our Savior resound and echo in the hearts of people throughout your church and throughout their lands. Hear us as we pray. We offer ourselves in your worship and in your service. In Jesus' name, amen. And now for the finale, Psalm 118e. We'll sing the first, uh, looks like five, 
six stanzas, and then after the benediction, we'll do stanza 18 as our doxology. Let's praise the Lord's name once again. 18, 118.18. La 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 Now open wide the gates for me The gates of righteousness And I will enter in through them With thanks the Lord of Christ This is the I'm thankful you have answered me, my Savior, you have That stone is now the cornerstone, that builders once despised. This is the doing of the Lord, and one grass in our hearts. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us be glad and sing. Hosanna. Comes in the Lord's great name, a blessing from the Lord's own house upon you who be proclaimed. has made the light arise with cords bind to the altar's point the festival sacrifice friends go with the blessing of god the grace of our lord jesus christ and the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, be and abide with you all. Amen. You are my God, I'll give you thanks, my God.